Today, I'm very honored and, um, and very excited to, to introduce to you today. We have as our speaker, Dr. Roger Skuern, who is um, a senior researcher at Rhodes University Geological Department. Roger is also a celebrated writer who has led explorations and feasibility programs across um, various parts of Africa and South Africa. And these um, programs have culminated in the development of things like the Marula Platinum Mine. He's also a fellow of the Geological Society of South Africa and of the Society of Economical Geologists and the Society, Geological Society of London. And also Roger, when his talk is based around um, his brand new book that's just come out called Geological Highlights of East African Parks. And um, just remember that for all attendees, you can get a 15% discount on Roger's new book. If you come and buy it from the Kirstenbosch Bookshop, you can either come and visit us there or you can uh, visit us online at www.kirstenboschbookshop.co.za. But uh, more about that at the end. Um, Roger will be taking questions at the end of his talk. You can, towards the end of the talk, you can just put your questions in the um, chat section and we'll deal with them as they come. So without any more waffle from me, Please welcome Roger and Roger, it's a great honor and we are so very pleased to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Greg. This is a very nice uh, introduction and welcome everybody to the talk. Um, unusual to do these Zoom talks as opposed to speaking in a, in a lecture theater where we can all see each other, but uh, I think this is a modern, modern way to go now. So. Uh, the, the talk is on the Africans, Africa's volcanoes, as you as you can see by the title, and it's aimed essentially at the educated layperson. So any geologist who happened to be joining in might find it a little bit um, too too generalised. But I think this is the nature of of how I wanted to present the talk. And the, the opening slide just shows my wife in the bottom left, Amelia. Um, coming off the summit of Mount Miru, which is one of these giant volcanoes, and we'll look at it a bit later on uh, as, as, the talk, as the talk progresses. So, so to start off with, if, if, it, uh, if the talk... Oh, no, we haven't uh, got the slideshow working. Let's try your arrow keys. Oh, arrow tree, I tried that. Okay, and click once on the slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Belinda. Great. So just a simple map to get the, to, to get the talk underway. I think the first thing you'll notice is that there's many more active volcanoes in Africa than maybe is generally realized. And as geologists, we like to uh, include the, uh, the, the geological plate as the entity. So you can also see that there, there are active volcanoes in both the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean on, on the plate next to us. The details of this Somalian microplate and all these different boundaries, we'll, we'll be looking at this map later on. This is just to introduce the idea of, of, of where, where most of the volcanoes are. They're either on the boundary with Europe or, or, or mostly in East Africa, and then these other, other ones sort of dotted around. And the sort of questions that geologists like to ask, you know, you know, which we would do about you know, just about every subject, we love grouping and categorizing the geological features on Earth that we look at. So in, in, when we look at volcanoes, a very simple way of categorizing them is, well, they're, they're active, dormant, or extinct, which we'll have a look at that in a moment. And then the distribution, you know, they, as you probably saw on the previous map, they're often aligned on linear arrays, and do they occur with, on continental or oceanic plate? And then we have different types of occurrences. They could be freestanding cones, they can be volcanic complexes, and we'll also learn about the difference between a crater and a caldera as the talk goes on. The pictures of an active lava lake, possibly well, well, one of the most active uh, lava lakes in the world, which is in the Niragonga volcano in the DRC. And that's the best example of an active volcano, just to, 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 to start the talk with a few pictures. 
situated near Goma. Um, many of you might know because of the recent eruptions that's been on the TV. And the and the, the, the cone is over here. And there's another volcano behind it, which uh, is essentially equally as active, but I won't mention all the names. It's just otherwise, I think it might become confusing with lots of names that people won't be familiar with. The picture on the left was taken by a lovely lady called Alice from the uh, the, um, the parks board there, and she very kindly sent me a copy uh, of, of the, essentially, it's not an eruption, it's actually the reflection of the lava lake in a cloud. And then you can see the, the view into the crater and then the lava lake with an active spatter cone next to it in the small slide on the right. There's a spatter cone erupt here, which was erupting when I when I visited, fortunately. And there's a, the lava lake sitting over here. And the, the lake has a diameter of about three to four hundred meters, by the way. Um, another active volcano would be the Piton de Fonais on the island of Reunion. Um, some pictures from a trip that the Geological Society of South Africa, South Africa organized some years ago. Top uh, right, looking into the crater, which is uh, looks like a lunar landscape. Um, and strange enough, one of my favorite views is to see these amazing lava flows where the island is just pushing out and, and continuously building new land. I think this photograph was taken over here on the island on the far left, and you can just imagine how, how these islands grow as the lava flows develop. Um, on the bottom right is a picture um, of, a, of an active er eruption back in the 19, early 1990s. Probably the most famous of the dormant volcanoes. Dormant's not really a geologically well-defined word, but it's a useful word because I think the general public understand what it means. Essentially, you know, the volcano isn't extinct and there's a, there is evidence of geothermal heat or there's a possible uh, eruption, um, you know, lined up. But, you know, uh, so dormant, you know, essentially is, is just a useful word to say, well, it's not active at the moment, but, you know, who knows? So th this is the main summit of Kilimanjaro, which, as you all would appreciate, is the highest uh, mountain in Africa. This is viewed from Amboseli, the classic view uh, from the Amboseli Park the elephant in the foreground. Mount Kenya, which is the second highest peak in uh, Africa, is an extinct volcano. And, the, and they have these iconic central peaks, Batian and Nelian, the two here, they're named after Maasai chiefs. Those are the two highest, two highest peaks separated by, by the Diamond Glacier. Then the pictures over to the, to the right, just showing the entrance to the park and some of the strange uh, botanical you know, aspects of these high mountains where where the altitude is, is resulted in very unusual types of vegetation. And I decided to, to restrict the talk to the Quaternary volcanoes, which, which are younger than 2.58 million years. And the Quaternary includes a little bit of the Pliocene period, which is, which is here between five and 1.8 million, all of the Pleistocene period, which is, as you, I'm sure all of you would appreciate is when the ice ages happened and also the Holocene, which is our, 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 our current period, which is 11,700 years before present, you know, and, you know, up until now. And many of the volcanoes are, you know, which are active at the moment are, 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 are Holocene volcanoes. And just a little bit, um, a couple of additional points which pertain just to East Africa is that the regional plateaus, which is such a feature of the whole African continent, form, started to form in the Jurassic, and they, they, they continued forming up until the Eocene period. And then the East African Rift System, which is where most of the volcanoes in East Africa are focused, started forming around 30 million years ago in the Oligocene period. So in geological terms, much younger rocks than we see here in South Africa. So a few little um, pointers to what volcanoes really are, just to try to get it to simplify it, that these things are not as complicated as, as maybe some people might think. You know, we can consider volcanoes as, as a pressure valve for the Earth's internal heat. And the, and the internal heat is about 50-50 divided between the primordial heat, which is retained from when the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and the radiogenic heat, you know, which is continuously and being generated 
you know, due to natural radioactivity in, 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 in inside the Earth, in the internal structure of the Earth. And we can, can, can consider a volcano as a rupture in the crust that allows the eruptions of, of, of magma, which is molten rock, to occur. And the eruptions can include lava, volcanic ash, pyroclastic flows, which are the very dangerous sort of, you know, lava and ash combined, as well as, as gas activity. And also an important point is that magma doesn't necessarily come from deep and erupt as volcanoes. It can also pond in the crust as magma chambers, which adds an extra complexity to, to studying volcanoes. And another way of looking at uh, vo volcanic eruptions, we can, can, can consider central volcanoes, which are fed by single conduits, which would, which would connect uh, deep inside the interior of the Earth. And they, they can form freestanding cones with summit craters, the example on the left is uh, the most active volcano in, in Tanzania, Odonya Lengai. The eruption um, in the lower slide uh, it was 2013. Um, and the, the top slide is uh, my colleague Morris Fiyun, who unfortunately passed on last year. Uh, we, we, we jointly organized a trip to this area in 1995, and that was Morris. Uh, viewing the volcano in the rift, you know, for, you know, from down in the rift valley, and we can also talk, you know, divide volcanoes into shield volcanoes, which are massive structures, strata volcanoes, which are layered, and then we have volcanic complexes as well. And then the other type of volcano can be volcanic activity. We we can des describe as plateau style style outpourings, also known as flood basalts, because they're, they're fed by fissures, and and these features can completely subsume the old landscape. And they create often create uh, plateaus, and and lava and the magma erupted from the fissures can form lava curtains. The picture in the bottom right is from Iceland. And because geologists, we can't really really explain anything really without the, the hypothesis of uh, continental drift. It it really links all of the geological features on Earth together. And it, it, it explains very neatly why volcanoes, which are shown here in red, and all the earthquake zones, which aren't shown, but why they cluster at the different plate boundaries. So we, we, have, we have convergent boundaries uh, <clears throat> over here in the subduction zone along the coast of, of South and North America, and, and the volcanoes cluster a, a, a line like this, often a few hundred kilometers to the east of the boundary, and we can see why that, that is in a moment. And we also have these divergent boundaries where the new crust, oceanic crust is being made, such as Hawaii. But unfortunately, uh, life's never quite that simple in geology. And we also have to have a theory which is known as hotspots, um, and of which Hawaii is, is the best example uh, one of the better examples that we can look at it in, in a moment. And there are, and the hotspots applies to the African volcanoes as well. So just to explain how a hotspot works, we believe that the, the magma is generated from, from a plume shown, shown here coming up from deep, a mantle plume. It's at the moment, the Hawaiian structure is, is under, underlying the main island of Hawaii here. And the idea is that the volcanoes get older in a chain in the direction that the plate is moving. So it, again, it does link to the, uh, to the plate tectonic hypothesis is the plume is fixed, but the plate is actually moving. So if we if you see a map, the main island Hawaii in yellow is where the plume is now, but five, five or six million years ago, the plume would have been underneath these volcanoes here. So I think this explanation to my mind works extreme, extremely well and as far as I'm aware just about all geologists would accept this. So now if we focus on to the African plate a bit more, first of all we can see that there's a there's a line of volcanoes which are related to the African Eurasian collision. So that's one of the uh, the uh, convergent plate boundaries and all, all, all the volcano a lot of uh, clusters of volcanoes along here and they're not considered necessarily to be part of Africa, but it's convenient for this talk to include them in the talk. So we'll look at those in a moment. The second, the main group of volcanoes are related to the East African rift system over here. And we have an Ethiopian rift, a Gregory rift, which is the Eastern rift, if you like, and the Albertine rift, the Western rift, which is the long, the long one, which comes all, all the way 
down towards Mozambique and southern, southern Africa. The Gorongosa Park, for those interested, is actually in a Rift Valley situated where the mouse is at the moment. We also have continental hotspots, of which Mount Cameroon, Cameroon would be the most well-known one. And we have oceanic hotspots, the Canary Islands reunion, which we can look at as the talk progresses. And the reason we recognize a Somalia microplate is because the rifting is, is really a process of creating a new ocean. And if the, if the rifting continued, Africa would divide into a, a Nubian plate, as we call it, and a Somalian microplate off to the east. And we, we would potentially generate an ocean in between. So, so the, the actual East African rift system in a way, is, is, a, is a plate boundary which is, which is currently being formed. So if we look at the, the first group, the African-Eurasian collision, which, as I said, just bear with me on this, there is a logic to why I've included these in an African talk. This is a picture of some volcanic scoria or bombs being thrown out of a Stromboli volcano. So probably the most famous volcano in the world is Vesuvius, as all of you would know, situated on the Gulf of Naples, but famous because of the AD 79 eruption, which um, partially destroyed Pompeii. And it was that was described by Pliny the Younger, which is an important point to remember. This is a view of Vesuvius in the background. And if you look on the right, you can see the crater, which formed from a relatively violent eruption in 1906. And behind is, is, is the summer caldera, which would be a circle structure, apologies for that. Um, and you can see it on the 3D image. The, the, the cone with the, crater, the active crater actually sits in, in an older caldera. So the calderas are much bigger structures. We'll see how that forms in a minute. And there's an even more dangerous caldera called Campi Flegri, where the city of Pazulu is situated right in the middle of the caldera, um, which essentially just joins up Naples and uh, Pazulu just sort of join on. It's a big conurbation along the bay. And they're very, very active and very dangerous systems. Um, the other famous uh, volcanoes in Italy are associated with Sicily and the Aeolian Islands. There's Etna in the foreground, a, a three-dimensional satellite image provided by my brother-in-law, Philip Eels, has a, is a specialist in this based in the UK. Um, and you can see in the background the uh, volcano is an active volcano, and, and Stromboli is the other active volcano in the Aeolian Islands. And, and in fact, the city of Catania lies at the base of uh, Etna, so it's, it's, which, and it's a very hazardous actually situation. On the left is a photograph of some of the cones on the top of Etna, which um, Amelia and I climbed some years ago, and pictures of Stromboli, which was known as the, the lighthouse of the Mediterranean. Um, in, in ancient mythology. And the reason to mention the word uh, volcano is because the word volcano is actually is derived from this locality. And as many of you, of, of you would know, Vulcan is the god of fire in, in Roman mythology. And the study of volcanoes, which is a specialized branch of geology, is therefore known as volcanology. And I'm certainly not a volcanologist, just so that you all know, I'm a, I would consider myself an all-rounder general geologist. And even here on the island of Volcano, of Volcano, we can see there's a bunch of older calderas on, on the south side of the island, and the active fossil cone uh, is actually developed in one of the volcanoes um, on the north side of the island. And, and, and not a very good picture down on the bottom right, um, but it's showing some of the sulfur deposits on, on, the, on the top of the cone. Another very famous volcano related to the, this, the, the Eurasian African collision across the Santorini, known as uh, Tira, to let the Greeks tend to call it Tira, the island of Tira. And, and, and the, the, the group of islands is actually de developed here around the caldera, which has a diameter of about, about five kilometers. And just out of interest, the caldera is so deep that the, the big ships, the cruise ships, which come in like this, they cannot anchor. Uh, is too deep and the harbors are too small. So they sort of cruise up and down all night trying to survive the wind. It's often very windy there. And Santorini, of course, is famous because of the, the Minoan event, and that, and that occurred around 600 B, 1600 BC, and the ash covered the top of the island. And all of these other layers 
I've done that again, apologies. All of these other layers are related to older caldera, caldera events. So the idea being is that there's multiple catastrophic eruptions to create these calderas. And then the city of Akrotiri, which was buried by the volcanic ash, gives you some information on, on, uh, on, on that uh, particular eruption. But it was such an amazingly catastrophic eruption that, that pumice actually maybe blocked up the whole eastern Mediterranean for two or three years. So I've, I've got a view that the, it certainly didn't end the Minoan civilization, as some people like to think. I think that's uh, generally dismissed. But it probably impacted their thinking because, you know, if you can't trade and sail between the islands because it's all blocked up with uh, pumice, you can imagine it must be, you know, a, a catastrophic event. So Santorini is an example of a volcano which, which is related to melting of, a, of a, a piece of oceanic crust, ancient crust, which has been, which is shown here in blue. Uh, and, it, and, and the idea is that the African plate is pushing to the north over here into the Eurasian plate, and that forces the ocean slab, which is denser than the continental crust, down to depth, and it melts at this particular depth, and therefore the volcanoes always come up at, at a distance of approximately 150 to 250 kilometers from that boundary. So, so this is where the, the hypothesis of continental drift actually works extremely well. And if we look at just a little bit of extra homework, if we look at magma compositions and the explosive nature of, of eruptions, we suddenly realize that the, that the magma has an incredible complexity of compositions and it can reflect the tectonic settings. So, you know, you know is it at a convergent or a divergent plate boundary? Is it a hot spot, et cetera, et cetera? You can have melting of continental or oceanic crust. You can have different proportions of mantle material coming up in the magma. And then as shown with those pictures on the right, the concept of magma chambers, if the magma ponds in the chamber, then maybe the magma from the top of the chamber gets erupted, but the magma at the bottom stays behind, a process known as differentiation, which can then, then create completely different compositions as well. And in a very simplistic way, just for, the, for this talk, it's quite handy to imagine that the continental magmas you can get one group, which is are alkaline basalts, which are poor in silica, but rich in, in alkali elements. You can also get continental magmas, which are rich in both silica and alkalis, and, and they're known as trachytes and phonolites and rhyolites, and they, they tend to have the most explosive eruptions. And the oceanic magmas, which are low in both silica and alkalis, they're relatively quiescent eruptions. And, and this is why I, I quite to, uh, thought I would add these different European volcanoes into the talk because this graph shows the, the explosive index of eruptions with the dispersal index over square kilometers to the right and the fragmentation index on the left, producing very, very fine grained volcanic ash for the most um, explosive eruptions. So the least explosive, the quiescent eruptions tend to be Hawaiian style because they melt oceanic crust. Slightly more active was Strombolian, named after the island of Stromboli, of course. And then the very explosive eruptions are all, they're known as Plinian events after Pliny the Younger's description of Vesuvius, which is why I mentioned that earlier. And then the Vulcanian, Vulcanian er events are slightly different. They can include um, some water into the uh, into the system, and it and, and it it creates that a strange description that they they call the volcano eruptions, which was noted on the slide earlier, of where the volcano sort of gets blocked up, and then it's clearing its throat with very explosive, but very but short-lived eruptions. And out of in, and um, the interesting point from this talk is that many of the African volcanoes ex experience highly explosive Plinian eruptions, and they include some of the best, the largest and best preserved calderas on Earth. So if we now go to the group two, the, 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 the volcanoes related to the East African rift system, well, the rifting is simply the lateral stretching and thinning of the crust, which is a fundamental process of continental drift, which is how we form oceans. And within the, in, within the continent, it forms the rift valleys. So there's a picture of the rift valley on the, uh, on, on the left, that's um, near Lake Natron in northern Tanzania. 
I uh, took that photograph with a telephoto from part way up a mountain, which is it looks make, makes it look a bit more dramatic than it really is. And there's a spatial relationship between rifting and volcanism, which explains explained by the uh, hypothesis that a magma plume, which underplates the crust, is driving both processes both processes at the same time. And of course, some of the volcanic scenery is quite spectacular a cluster of volcanic cones and quite thickly wooded at Marsabat in, in Kenya, in the north of Kenya. So if we look at a satellite image, you can see that other than the, in, in addition to the rift valleys, we also have the, these, these high, high areas which are known as the Ethiopian Dome and the Kenyan Tanzanian Dome. And that seems to be a strange feature um, next to rift valleys, and it's explained because the, the crust in the rifting behaves in an elastic manner and, 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 and it rises next to the rift valleys as compensation for the dropping of the rifts. And you can see that with the Ethiopian rift, you have this fire triangle, which is one of the most intense period, uh, areas of volcanic activity in the world. The Gregory Rift is also has a, also has a high volcanic output, and there's chains of volcanoes all the way along here. But the Albertine Rift, which hosts Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi, as well as Lake Kivu and Lake Albert in, on the Uganda DRC uh, border, you know that has a low volcanic output, and the, vo the volcanoes which do occur in the Albertine Rift have a different a different story behind them, as we, we'll see later on. So if we look at the rift-related volcanism, how we explain it is, is really, in the first slide, there's a development of a, of a, of a magma plume at depth or, or mantle plume, which is causing hot buoyant magma to ascend and underplate the crust, which causes the crust eventually to dome up and we form magma chambers in the crust and we, we, we fracture it and the magma can be fed up through the fissures either into fissure systems on surface or, in, or into these freestanding or central volcanoes where we get volcanic cones. We can have, uh, the cones can have a crater and, and we have parasitic vents and a whole range of features. And in some cases we get stratovolcanoes and stratovolcanoes, the only difference really to the uh, the, the shield volcanoes is that they're layered, and the layering is, is, is in a simplistic way meant to be alternating layers of magma and volcanic ash, but often it's hugely dominated by volcanic ash because the strata volcanoes tend to exhibit evidence of these very catastrophic planini eruptions. So most of the uh, material erupted is ash rather than lavas, and it's often just layers and layers and layers of ash built up from many, many eruptions which can go on for long periods of time. Some of the volcanoes in, in East Africa uh, have been, have show evidence of erupting for maybe as long as two to three million years. And the magma is provided from a, in this case, it's shown to be provided from a, a relatively shallow magma chamber. And the second slide shows how, how, why a caldera is so different to a crater. A caldera is, is actually a tectonic feature where, where, the, where the whole cone of the volcano has collapsed down into the magma chamber. So you can you end up with a caldera scarp, faults on the edge, showing it dropping down. And then the idea is that this is gen not always, but generally caused by, by rapid or even instantaneous depletion of the magma chamber. So, so if, if that chamber empties or, or, you know, almost instantaneously, there's a big void below, the, the volcanic cone collapses and we form a caldera. And you saw from the pictures in Europe, Santorini and um, uh, Campi Flegri in, in, and even Vesuvius, that the calderas can be, they often have diameters of five to six kilometers, whereas a crater is often measured in hundred, hundreds of meters. But if we come to Africa, the Ngorongoro caldera, which is possibly the most famous wildlife destination in Africa, if not in our, on Earth, this form from a catastrophic eruption, a caldera event, as we call it, at 2 million years. It's two, almost exactly 2 million years old. And the caldera here is, has a diameter shown on this geological map of 20 kilometers. So it's far larger than the calderas we saw earlier. The walls on, on the caldera shown on the panoramic slide on the top are essentially still intact because it's only 
it's relatively uh, youthful, it hasn't eroded that much. And the most remarkable feature about the caldera is all the different ecosystems which occur inside the caldera. In Lake Magadi, the main, uh, the, the biggest lake, which is shown on the picture on the right, it, it, it is a soda lake, but there's also freshwater swamps as well and freshwater uh, springs and swamps. And there's a river which feeds this. And there's a little bit of a forest down here, as well as the open plains. So it's, you know, really is a, a Garden of Eden, which uh, many of you might have visited or, or, or seen it on the wildlife documentaries. So, and, and the key is that it's a caldera. Um, it's often referred to as a cr crater, but that's really incorrect. And, and interesting that the guides and the rangers, when you visit, they all call it calderas as well which is nice to hear. So if we look at very briefly the volcanism Ethiopian Rift, which I haven't visited, so very brief. These are, are some amazing lava flows in the Danakil Depression. Um, and you can see from the notes on the right that there's, there's, there's possibly uh, 53 Holocene volcanoes in Ethiopia, which would all be gazetted as, act, as active, 10 active just in the last couple of hundred years, and five are currently active. The most well-known one is Erta Ali, which also has a lava lake. So Africa actually has three volcanoes with lava lakes. And I think um, that I could be, could be wrong on this, but I think there might only be six lava lakes at the moment in the world. A lava lake is simply where the lava, the magmas come erupted in, usually inside the crater. And uh, once it's erupted, we refer to the magma as lava and it's staying molten for the simple reason that it's there's a flow between the magma chamber at depth and there must be dense cooler magma sinking down and the hotter fresh magma coming up which maintains the temperature because quite often these lava lakes have a relatively fixed volume and unless there's a big eruption and the cone here is only 600 meters high so it's probably a relatively easy volcano to go and visit if if it's uh, safe to go there if we look at the, the activity in the Gregory Rift, Kenya, Northern Tanzania, you see that there's a, there's a whole line of, of active and dormant volcanoes in the Rift Valley. We won't mention all the names, there's just too many to, men, to, to actually mention. The picture, the, the top picture on the right is actually uh, an island in Lake Beringo, which is, which is over here on the map, which is one of the only two freshwater lakes in the Rift. And these are the islands in the lake are related to the Karossi volcano, just to the north, and you know, there's the basalt lava, typical dark basaltic lava. And then the crater at the bottom is is, is one of three active systems in uh, in in Lake in Lake Tukana. And just uh, to note on the map that although the map is restricted to the Rift Valley, uh, Mount Kenya would be would be situated, um, it's almost on the equator somewhere over here, Mount Kenya. And then there's a lot of uh, volcanoes in uh, clustering in northern Tanzania. Uh, the Kibo is the main peak of Kilimanjaro. This is just showing the active or dormant volcanoes, not the extinct ones. And then the Miro volcano that we mentioned earlier, and Ordonia Lingai next to Lake Natron. Lake Natron is here. And so, if we just have a quick look at some of the some of the main features, Kilimanjaro, it's actually a volcanic edifice, it is, it, which indicates that there's a long-lived system of conduits which may have been active for more than two million years. So it's made up of three separate volcanoes, as shown on the photograph on the bottom right, Mwenzi and um, Shira are extinct, and Kibo, which is the highest one, is, is, is dormant. And uh, Kibo last erupted at about 100,000 years ago, but there is evidence uh, that the Roish crater up on, on, the, on the summit plateau, there's, there's geothermal heat and there's evidence of magma down at depth. So it's just been dormant for a while. The picture on the right, by the way, is taken from when we were climbing Mount Miru, where you get some of the nicest views. And of course, you know, some of the volcanoes of which Kilimanjaro is the most well known are so high that, 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 they, that there are ice, ice sheets and glaciers, despite the equatorial setting, which was a big shock when this was first reported to, to the European audience, that you could have ice fields in Africa. It gives you some idea of how, how, how large these volcanoes are. 
And um, you can see the Roish crater in, in the summit of Kiba, there's Mowenzi, which is a more precipitous peak because it's been much more, much more deeply eroded because it's older. And we can see that the, uh, this is a historical photograph from 1931 showing the ice fields and also snow, uh, to be fair, um, you know, a big covering of snow. And of course, as, as most of you would know, the, the ice fields are, are retreating at a, 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 at a rapid rate. Um, Mount Kenya, just to go back to this um, iconic, the picture of these iconic central peaks on the left, you know, they, they require a technical climb, uh, whereas Kilimanjaro, is, as you would be aware, is, is really a hike rather than a climb. Although I must say it's, it's still tough going because of the altitude. But Mount Kenya is, requires some snow and you know, ice and rock climbing to get to the summit. And the reason is, is that the summit is, is, is related to a feature that we call a volcanic plug. There's two examples, well-known, world-famous examples of volcanic plugs, a little islet next to Stromboli and the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, which was used in that weird um, movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And what happens is that when the, when the, when the magma erupts as a lava, this is the phonolite lava, which is the main lava type in Mount Kenya, and you've got little crystals, phenocrysts of feldspar, um, that, that's how we refer to the lava. But it, the, when, it, when it blocks up the, vol the volcanic uh, conduit, it forms a plug of crystalline rock, which in this case is cyanite. Now, the cyanite and the phonolite have the same composition, but we use different names because they look different because of the crystal structure and so on. So in actual fact, it's, it's the, the, there's, a lot, there's a good geological explanation as to why the central part of Mount Kenya has these uh, very steep, you know, deeply eroded peaks. The erosion, of course, a lot of the erosion was during the Ice Age. Kenya is slightly, Mount Kenya is slightly older than Quaternary, but I just sort of slipped it in. So if we looked at a map, all the greens, the different types of green, it's not that, and browns is not important. That's just all the volcanic lavas. And, and you can see that the out, outline of the National Park is shown here. And of course, the, vo the volcanic lavas are spread down the slopes much further than the boundary of even of the mountain appears. If you look at the cross section down below, and the red, which is on the map, is showing here. This is the central uh, the central peaks so are here. Just a tiny feature on the on the broad scale, because the diameter, if we take into all the lower slopes, is close to 100 kilometers, and 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 then you can see the. the the, co the conduit, which this, mount, this uh, volcanic plug forming this vertical feature, which probably goes down, you know, many, many tens of kilometers in, in, into the deep into the crust. And there's some subsidiary uh, plug shown in pink next to it. Um, mount Miru, the, the, the uh, picture that we had, we started to talk with, this is the fourth highest uh, mountain in, in Africa. Um, in fact, the view is of Little Miru. This is from the summit, Little Miru over here, which you often, well, we, we climbed it as a little warm up bit. There's a big caldera, which formed uh, possibly 8,000 years ago, relatively recently, and it's still active in the caldera. So this counts as an active volcano. You get fantastic views of Kilimanjaro in the background. Inside the volcano in the caldera is an ash cone, which has not been dated, but it's possibly just a few thousand years old. And the, the most recent eruption was 1910, um, Ashcone uh, uh, emitted a little bit of smoke, but there are very recent lava flows which are unvegetated. And as you can see, a lot of the area in the caldera has to be very recent because there's no vegetation at all. Um, if we look at Mount Longanot, this is one of the classic volcanoes in the, actually within the Rift Valley in Kenya, not too far from Nairobi. Potentially, it, it, the cone sits inside the caldera. There's been another caldera event here as well. It's essentially a very dangerous, very hazardous volcano. It last erupted in 1863. So we, we, we would gazette this as, as an active feature. There's a little uh, parasitic cone down there on, on, on the right. And the highest point on the, on the uh, crater rim is just here, which Amelia and I we we walked uh, we we climbed up and walked round round you know around the rim of the crater, which is which quite a nice experience because you're not allowed inside the crater and it feels like a sort of looking down into the lost world, um, sort of memories of reading Arthur Conan Doyle. 
right next to Longanot is a volcanic complex. Um, not there's no cone, there's no no mountains at all called Alcaria, and and this is actually an active volcanic field that also erupted sometime in the 1800s. But you hear the uh, the lavas and ash uh, uh, have a very different composition to Longanot, even though it's very close. And here we see the ry rhyolite lavas that I mentioned earlier, and mostly rhyolite ash, lava in the ignin bright sheet, which is a pyroclastic uh, flow on the right, with very, which, which cools as the bottom of the flow and there's the top, and it cools to make this columnar jointing. You can also, it also has quite steep outcrops. This is known as Fisher's Tower. He was one of the early the German explorer um, who actually went to this area with Thompson in the late 1800s. <clears throat> and there's a comparison with the Yellowstone, Yellowstone supervolcano. These are pictures of Yellowstone and uh, the rhyolitic ash, or rhyolite, it's generally yellow, hence the name of the Yellowstone Park, some geyser fields as well as an active geyser. Now you don't see this in Ocaria, but the, the comparison is it, it, it geologically is very close, and and in historical time, Alcario probably experienced some uh, extreme catastrophic uh, acti activity. The gorge, by the way, was carved by a, a, a flood, probably related to the to change in the, the behavior of the, the lakes in the ice age, and it, it's it's generally dry, but it does it can suffer catastrophic floods, and unfortunately, a few. Several tourists were drowned some years back, and they've now got escape routes. And one of the key things about rhyolitic lava, lava is that they can crystallize obsidian, and uh, which is also known as volcanic glass. And in and Jura Gorge, you can get you can see big lumps. This is about about six inches across in the in the floor of the uh, of the gorge, and also you get the banded banded rhyolite uh, banded obsidian in in the rhyolitic. Uh, in the rhyolitic ash. And not too far away is the Olegasali archaeological site, which probably has the largest number of stone tools ever found in one place, found by the, uh, the Leakins, uh, Dr. Leakey, many years ago. Um, and that's got an age of approximately a million years. And a lot of the tools are made from obsidian, which could well have been uh, derived from Enjoro Gorge or alternatively trachyte lava, which could have come from, uh, from Longanot. Um, and of course, there's evidence of geothermal heat in, in, in the Gregory Rift. The top picture is, is showing active geysers in Lake Begoria. Uh, um, lake Begoria is an alkaline lake, and you can see, I think, some flamingos off to the right of the picture. And the Ocaria geothermal field, the pictures that we were looking at just now, has a, has a, has a uh, you know, it generates a, a, fair, a fair amount of Kenya's electricity from... Uh, essentially green energy, energy just by tapping, drilling wells and tapping the superheated steam, which is, which is being driven off. So, so the, you know, the magma chamber is relatively shallow and, and you know, everybody is well aware that it's a very active system. You can also see lavas in the Sava West National Park, which uh, one of the well-known parks in, in Kenya, which featured in the, the movie Out of Africa, if you remember where the railway line goes across. And it, here you see the, the shatani, which means devil, the devil's lava flow. And if you look at the picture on the top right, it comes out of a little cinder cone and vent here, uh, comes down in a curve and then flows down towards uh, where I was standing to take the picture. And there's Amelia. I think we were looking at elephants on the on the picture on the bottom left in, at some distance. And our guide, Mohammed, was looking after us. And you can also um, climb down into lava tubes here because sometimes the lava flows in tubes below the surface, uh, particularly the basaltic lava can be relatively fluid. And as you can see from the picture on the right, Sabo is known as the ancient land of lions and lava. That's how they, they've painted up a little sign. That's partly because of the famous story of the man eating lions when they, when they built the, the railway. We look at the old Donya Lengai, the, the, the volcano that we uh, looked at earlier on. This is a spectacular picture, which I, I got off the internet on the top right, an aerial shot. That's of the crater in the 1990s, which I visited with friends. Uh, my friend Clyde Mallinson is now an energy expert. He's quite often on the news at the moment. Um, he's in the picture here. We're looking at this very unusual white uh, ash. And, and the reason it's got this unusual color is because it's it's um, 
It's a, it's a magma type known as a, a natrocarbonatite, a sodium-rich carbonatite, which means it's a carbonate magma, whereas almost all other mag, uh, magmas in the world are silicates. So this, and this is the only volcano on Earth where you can see these carbonate magmas being erupted um, uh, currently. There are lots of carbo car carbonatite complexes in the world where these uh, rocks can be seen in the geological record, but this is the only active volcano of this type. But the, unfortunately, the crater which we climbed into and took these pictures of these very strange lava flows and um, an active vent here. This is a, a, like a channel way between lavas. And, and the, the lava, this carbonatite lava, has the lowest viscosity of any known uh, natural magma. So you get very, very thin flows, which is illustrated here. But unfortunately, there's been so many eruptions since and a very violent eruption in 2013. So the crater is no longer, no longer accessible. And not too far away, um, about... Uh, 40, 50 kilometers off to the west on the edge of the Serengeti Plains, but in the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, is Olduvai Gorge, the famous anthropological site where a couple of the famous hominid uh, skulls discovered by Mary Leakey and categorized by Louis Leakey, of course, all those years ago, dated at 1.848 million years, so it's well within the Quaternary Range. They're actually preserved in volcanic ash, as well as lake bed sands, and, and, and the ash was deposited below a lake, uh, in a lake, and it's known, and then it's known as a tuff. And this is the marker tuff layer which separates bed one and bed two. There's no fossils in bed three because it's the sandstone. And if you look at the photograph on the right, you can see this is the sandstone sticking up in a nice butte. You can see in the background, that's, that's in Gorongora, and this is the Olmoti volcano. And that's where where the ash has been derived from. So that, you know, the, the, when the hominids were here, 1.848 million years, it was just a hundred thousand or so years after that big catastrophic eruption of of Ngorongoro. So a lot of the evolution, which was driven by you know climate change and the, the uh, you know hominids obviously appearing to occupy the ecosystem as the, as the forest retreated westward and we had these opening up of the savanna grasslands while there was a lot of volcanic active volcanic activity and rifting going on at the same time and the and the famous footprints like Tolly, they're actually a little bit older they're from the Sadaman volcano dated at 3.6 million years you don't necessarily have to climb the mountains to see the volcanoes. There's gorges, um, such as this Ingara Siro Gorge. Uh, Ingara is a, a river in uh, Swahili, which 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 the gorge is um, cutting into the Ngorongora highlands, and this exposes a whole whole lot of the volcanic rocks which you see uh, in associate with Ngorongora, which is a cluster of volcanoes. It's not just the one the one cone. And if we switch rifts now from the Gregory Rift to the Albertine Rift, we can see in southern Tanzania, there's actually three active volcanoes, which are often, uh, which are not particularly well known, and that Rungui and Ngozi and Kaiyo, uh, which, and, that's, and that erupted as recently as 1800. And they're situated actually at a, at a triple junction in the rift, where two subsidiary rifts join into the main Albertine Rift. And you can visit the Katolo National Park, the picture on the right, and you see amazing profusion of wildflowers which grow on the, uh, on the volcanic soils, which are often very fertile. And if we go further north on the Alberta Albertine Rift, DRC, Rwanda, Uganda, we get a, we get a whole cluster of craters, uh, crater fields in, 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 in the rift in this area. Some have crater lakes and you have salt pans where the, where the water is essentially dried. Some of the, uh, the craters are very scenic. And there's a whole bunch of them in the uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park, um, which, was, which was named after the, our late Queen's uh, visit in um, the same time she visited uh, treetops in Kenya, I think, 19... 52. I could be wrong on that, but it was named a long time ago. Um, but the, the, the Virunga Mountains, which are, which are also in the Albertine Rift, we believe that these are related not to the rifting, but to actually a localized hotspot. So this now introduces the third group of volcanoes that was shown on the, on the map earlier in the talk. 
So we have a continental hotspot, and I won't mention the names of all the volcanoes because it becomes too much, but the active ones are over here in the west. There's Niragonga there, and there's the Tainagoma. Um, and there's three national parks. There's, there's the Virunga Park, which is in, in the DRC, the uh, Volcanoes National Park which in uh, Rwanda, which is the premier place to visit the mountain gorilla, and also the, the uh, <coughs> Magahinga Gorilla Park in Uganda, where you can also see the gorilla as well. So the Virunga is a chain of eight volcanoes, and they're al it's aligned essentially at right angles to the rift, which is why we have an ex uh, a separate ex explanation. And the idea is that the plate just like on that slide of Hawaii, the plate is, is widening and this time it's moving to the east. So the active volcanoes are over in the west. So, so the extinct and dormant volcanoes over here, the, these two are also extinct. Bisoki actually has an active center, so it doesn't work perfectly, but the main activity is over, over here in, in the west. And if you see this fracture chain here, just keep an eye on that, you can see that feeds uh, lava right down towards Goma and, and Lake Kivu shown on the bottom of the slide here. <clears throat> so this is a, a picture from uh, the Twin Lakes looking at the, the, the chain of, of six of the, the dormant or the extinct volcanoes on the Uganda, Rwanda more and more, and then, then the same slide that we saw earlier of the two active volcanoes at the end of the chain. And if just a few more details on the in, in Uragonga volcano, the, the major eruption in 1977 was when the lava lake literally filled up the crater and overflowed. That was a catastrophic event, which, which um, unfortunately there were many deaths um, as the lava went right through the city of Goma. 2002, it was a slightly smaller eruption, but still a major event with, uh, a, a, unfortunately, affected um, a lot of people adversely. The fissures on the southern slopes opened up and lava again flowed into the city. And as you can see on the picture on the right, all the black, it actually uh, you know, destroyed part of the airport and the runway. And the most unusual feature is that the lavas here are potassium rich, whereas we saw they were very sodium rich in, in, at Odonia Lengai in Tanzania, here they're very potassium rich because of the hotspot story, similar possibly to Vesuvius. And these magmas also have very low viscosity and they can, they, 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 you know, very, very fast moving flows, greater than 40 kilometers an hour, maybe even as, as much as 60 to 80 kilometers an hour on the steep slopes. So because unlike most lavas, like you see the pictures in Hawaii, you can't outrun them. So it's a very, very hazardous volcano. And you can see the proximity to Lake Kivu on the picture on the right. And Lake Kivu actually has is saturated in both methane and carbon dioxide gas, which has come from the volcanic eruptions, possibly from lavas, but more likely from fissures underlying the lake. And the gas occurs at depth simply because the pressure is uh, the water pressure exceeds the gas pressure, so it doesn't bubble up. Um, and there's, uh, it's very hazardous, and we can we can make a, a comparison with the devastating gas eruption which happened at Lake Nyos in, in the Cameroon in 1986, which I think tens of thousands of people unfortunately died. And of course, the carbon dioxide is, if anything, more hazardous because, as you would know, you can't see it, smell it, or feel it in any way. And because it's heavier than air, it, it fills up the valleys. Um, you know, and, and you just don't know it's happening until you're asphyxiated. So that leads us on to Mount Cameroon, which I haven't visited. So just a very brief couple of photographs just to show that there is an active volcano there. And it, it, it's probably part of another continental hotspot because um, it's a chain of volcanoes, which, 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 which includes some of the islands out in, out in the Gulf of Guinea. This Bisoki would, Bioki would be the youngest. The other two are much older, so I'm not quite sure how that fits in with the hotspot story. Uh, but I don't really know much about that. But I, I wanted to in, in, include it in the talk just to, to show you that there is a volcanic center in the Cameroon. We now move on very quickly to the oceanic hotspots. I put it as 4A. This would be the ones in the Atlantic. As all of you know, the, the Canary Islands belong to, to Spain. and. Um, this, the graphic on the top showing the, the relationships so of the Spanish volcanologists have done a lot of detailed work here as well. So the, the, 
The uh, canary is also related uh, related to a, to a hotspot, and this is a 2021 eruption of the La, La Palma volcano. And of course, one as geologists, we like looking at the pictures and studying them. But as you can see, about where houses are buried in the ash, the picture on the right, and there was no loss of life here, I don't think. But of course, you know, one has to f remember the human impact the whole the time all the time. And the, the, the biggest problem potentially with the uh, canary uh, volcanic activity, particularly on La Palma, is it could generate uh, landslides into the sea, which into the ocean, which could generate tsunamis, which would take, as you can see, about eight, eight hours to reach the USA, shorter time to reach Europe. And, and the tsunami waves could be absolutely enormous if, if there was a massive slip. So it's a, it's a huge, hugely dangerous uh, problem level volcanic activity in the Canaries, which is closely monitored. There are volcanic islands in the South Atlantic. Now, they're not really hotspot related, but I've just slipped them in simply because South Africa has a close relationship, particularly to Gough Island, which is um, studied as part of the South African Atlantic uh, Research Program. And you can see, you know, Ascension, St. Helena, are older volcanoes, Tristan de Kuna is active, and Gough Island would also be part of an active system um, just hasn't erupted for uh, recently. And of course, an interesting point that the, the volcano associated with St. Helena, or is actually a cluster of volcanoes, because it rises from such a deep ocean, you can imagine how much larger it is as a huge series of cones compared to, for example, Etna, which is the largest volcano in Europe. They're massive features, some of these features, but it's really related to the plate boundary rather than the hotspot. If we look at the, um, Hotspots in the Indian Ocean. We have two main active volcanoes. We have uh, Reunion, which we saw the picture earlier on, picture, and that's there's a, the same photograph on the right. And we also have an active volcano, La, La Grill volcano, in the Comoros Islands here. And the and the idea is that these are also related to hotspots, but they're separate hotspots, and that the, the plate in this area is, is migrating to the southwest, but the plate at Reunion is migrate is 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 actually moving is moving the other way, and in fact this volcanic chain here, oops, done that a couple of times. Apologies. This volcanic chain can actually connect all the way to the Deccan Traps uh, volcanic activity in 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 India. And in fact, it explains why the active volcano is in reunion and Mauritius, which is also volcanic, but is, is extinct at the moment. I've labeled the Eldebra Island and, and the island of Mayotte, as we're just going to look quickly there. Eldebra Island is an extinct volcanic sea mount. It's a World Heritage Site. I think David Attenborough explained on one of his recent documentaries um, that it's one of the most remarkable places in the world because of the evolution of the of the Eldebrin giant tortoise. So fairly obviously these, these uh, volcanic sea mounts and coral atolls, which cap them, you can see it's an atoll because there's a lagoon in the center of the island, uh, end up, you know, end up with the island style speciation and, and um, you know, the unusual species, which are set, which are unique to each island. And there's also a group of islands between Madagascar and um, Mozambique in the Mozambique Channel, which are known as the scattered islands of the Indian Ocean, that's translated from the French, because they happen to be all controlled by France for various historical reasons. And they're, they're coralline islands, but they, 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 they almost certainly cap uh, sea mains. So the May, May, Mayotte, which is over here, you can see a little note down here, an active uh, volcanic sea mount was only discovered in 2019, 50 kilometers to the east of, uh, of, of the island. And, and all of this activity could also potentially generate tsunamis, which, which could potentially affect both Mozambique and South Africa. And I don't think that any, there's, there's tsunami monitoring of, of, the, of these areas. Um, just as a final slide, just to wrap it up, trekking on Mount Miru is a fantastic activity for those of you who feel fit enough to go on a big climb. This is the, this is the uh, as I said, there's Amelia coming off the summit. You've got all of these volcanic ash and lavas, uh, uh, which make this big ridge. And there's there's the actual summit uh, dome, which is which is also shown in the bottom left. And you can stay in these fantastic mountain huts and also the views of the afro mountain forest, which is full of remarkable birds, particularly Turicos, which is, is, is an absolutely fantastic national park. 
So there we go. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, just a picture of a, a black panther, which is a melanistic leopard, of course, in the correct uh, terminology from uh, Isla Man Kenya or the Abadares. And just a hint that the uh, the volcanic soils in these areas and the volcanic features have also uh, resulted in almost an island style speciation pattern on the continent, let alone in the islands itself, which is which is covered much more in the book in my new in, in my new book. So thank you very much for listening. Roger, fantastic talk. Thank you so much for for that. Um, really, some amazing insights from your part. Um, I'm sure that everybody else can join me in saying that it was a, a lovely, lovely talk. Um, we do have some questions for you. Um, in the, I've got one from Inga Brandt Shahia, who says, um, when they climbed Mount Ararat um, in 2010, they heard repeated heavy rumbling of stones in the valley and a slight tremor where we were standing. The guide told us that the valley which was now full of stones, was empty when he was young. He explained that the noise was volcanic activity. Um, what's your comment on this? Well, I haven't been, I've been to Cappadocia, which is not too far away, um, but I think it's an active volcano. So there's, there's magma, probably movements of magma down at depths causing seismic events, which, which causes landslides on surface. I, I, I would imagine it's as simple as that. And in actual fact, in a Cappadocia, where you've got those famous uh, fairy chimneys and those volcanic pinnacles, it's all volcanic. And all the volcanoes in that area, you know, they were mentioned in the Bible. Um, one of the chapters in the Bible talk about the uh, active vol volcanic activity, you know, in, in biblical times in Asia Minor, as Turkey would have been known in those days. So yeah, there's, there, there's several chains of active volcanoes in that area. Thanks. And another question is from um, Roger Abbott saying, is there a likelihood of any volcano activity happening in South Africa in the near future? As far as I'm aware, not at all. No, the, the volcanic, uh, all the volcanic rocks here are, are, are ancient features. I, I would imagine the youngest would be in what we call the Karoo system, approximately... Uh, maybe 120 to 140 million years old would be the, the youngest activity, I would think. So definitely extinct. Um, That's good you, to hear. Yeah, and if you can, Gough <laughs> Island, because I think that does, you know, because it's administered by South Africa, I guess you could you could say, yeah, there is a, there's definitely potential activity there in the Atlantic Ocean and also in those little low sea mounts in the Mozambique Channel, which, which could potentially have an impact with tsunamis. Thanks. And uh, David Maria also has a question saying there's, um, he believes there's an extinct volcano near Sutherland. Um, any comments? Yeah, it's, it's a, again, it's part of the Karoo supergroup. And it's always, I've, I've heard people, I know when I went to the observatory, they say, now this is the youngest volcano in South Africa. And I'm not sure of the age, but I would take a guess. It's somewhere around 120 or 140 million years. Right, well, I think that's time for us to um, close up. Thank you so much, Roger. That was fantastic. Um, just um, a quick note that Strake will be doing an official launch of um, Roger's book, The Geological Highlights of Eastern Africa's National Parks, but they'll be sending out info about that, and that should happen sometime in October. So, um, yes, that's the book. There's Thank a copy of the book. <laughs> A little bit of advertising. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. And so now, you know, if you're going to go on a safari to East Africa and you want to go and visit some of these amazing sites, you know what book to get. Um, and otherwise, you can just sit in your in your in, at home and, and read about these fascinating um, subjects that uh, Roger's been kind enough to share with us today. So thank you so much from our side, Roger. And thank you all the participants of the talk who joined us this morning it's been truly a fascinating talk thank you so much yep. thank you everybody thank you greg <laughs>